Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Cool. Oh, what's that weird sound? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, you have a, a, a film scoring project called um, Henderson um, Henderson Maroon. Mar- yeah. yeah. Which totally makes sense given your skill set. Um, how's that going? Uh, yeah, it's going well. Um, so obviously I'm Henderson and Paul Maroon is Paul Maroon. Yeah. Uh, is the Maroon side. <clears throat> um, and we met when uh, Fleet Foxes toured with Walkman. Uh, that was the last band that he was in. And, uh, and yeah, we've, we've done uh, a handful of projects, um, that, uh, that were, um, really fun to make and, and that we're proud of. And, and actually Paul, uh, recently this last, um, Oscars, mm. uh, the, the first project that he worked on, um, sort of in our catalog, uh, won for, uh, an Oscar for best, uh, short. Wow. Um, and so which was a movie called uh, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, I think. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's how it's going. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's been cool. Yeah, so Paul and I have that. And, um, and uh, yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was all Paul, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> okay. It's cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, in our last chat, we talked about your love of running a bit. Um, and then I realized that in a lot of Fleet Fox's press photos, <laughs> you're wearing runners. Uh, uh-huh. So I wonder, when you're in a photo shoot, are the band ever like, again with the running shoes, Morgan? <laughs> um, uh, they probably, I don't know if they said anything. They might have thought it. I don't, I don't know. Right. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I think that uh, as time goes on, if you wear running shoes or if you're a runner, you know, it becomes difficult to wear any other shoe because they're just more comfortable uh, to be in. Um, but also one photo shoe in particular, um, I thought we were going to go, I thought we were going to have more time in between these two photo shoots Mm. and I was going to go home and get like non running shoes. (laughs) And, uh, I turned out to not have the time. So I have running shoes on (laughs) in the photo because that's the only shoes I had. Yeah. I guess the legitimate question that, that, sort of raises is um like how much do, does each band member's personal tastes in like music and style and even pop culture overlap huh um i think they overlap mm. quite a bit um like sky runs quite a bit um yeah. as well uh and uh casey's starting to run more mm. um um and so, as far as running goes, yeah, you know, we there's some people who are runners, um, and uh, music-wise, I don't know. I think there's overlap. It's, it's hard for me to think of where everywhere everybody overlaps. Um, I feel like Sky more often than not is the one playing music backstage or making the playlist between him and Casey making the playlist before we play that people hear, you know, just in the, in the, uh, club or wherever. Um, and so, uh, there's things that we listen to in common, but some things that I just hear for the first time from him. And, Mm. um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a fair amount of overlap between our interests. Yeah. Yeah. Musically and otherwise. Yeah. Mm. I noticed that sky, um, wears a lot more black recently in press photos and uh, mm-hmm. Robin seems to be a bit more, I guess the word for it would be normcore as compared to the sort of bearded woodsman sort of attire from a few years ago. Would that mm-hmm. be um, a result of some sort of personal progression in taste or maybe stem from the idea of folk fatigue that we spoke about last time? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you'd have to ask him that yeah. question. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't I don't know what uh directs is their um their clothing choices, but Sky definitely prefers to wear all black all the time. Fair so enough. That's, that's his uh you know MO the, what he, yeah, it's his MO. <laughs> uh, so Crack Up has been has a like a really um experimental sort of avant garde sound palette, um, but also this really intimate almost mumbled vocal and um you know opposed to the full-throated singing from 
maybe previous albums. And I'm, which I find really interesting because like um, the indie folk scene lately has kind of maybe evolved or devolved into this kind of the tropes of like yelling, hey, ho, and um, just simple chord progressions that they just bang out over and over again. Um, and so whether consciously or not, it seems like you guys have gone the complete other way with sort of more complex and avant-garde sounds in this this recent one. Can you talk me through the process of developing that sound or contributing to that sound? Um, that's sort of more like a Robin question. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but I've, I've observed those things too. Yeah, yeah. Was it... Yeah, fair enough. Okay, okay. So you, you did notice it and clocked it sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the album doesn't have any haze or hose on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Um, it seems like each album draws motifs or inspirations from um, places in the world. So Montezuma, Mykonos, and in this recent, in Crack Up, there's references to mountains in Japan or Daigahara. Um, would that be correct? Um, I mean, that's definitely a reference on the, on crack up. Um, um, but, um, yeah, so there's definitely, all, it seems like he writes, uh, or the imagery that he often pulls up is, you know, nature related, mm. um, quite often, definitely earlier on than I'd say now, but yeah. Yeah. Are these places physically traveled or just, I don't know came across in, in readings or something? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, sort of another Robin question. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm sure he's probably been to some of the places that, that um, you know, that he's singing about. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so I've noticed that in indie folk in the past decade or so, um, gender is portrayed in this very sort of binary archetype. Like men have like, you know, very rugged lumberjack-esque frontier spirit sort of look about them, whereas women have this sort of um, maiden-like femininity. Is is that something you've noticed as well? Um, well, I don't really pay attention to like folk, like whatever, you know, that is. Mm. Like that's not the music I listen to. Um so I'm not, I wouldn't say hyper aware of, you know, how, what, what the, uh, what the gender roles are mm. in, in those genres, but I, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I think the, the sort of lumberjack and maiden, uh, trope is pretty strong and people fall into that for one reason or another. Mm. Um, sure. Yeah. But as far as the f indie folk world goes, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so a question that I asked from our last chat, um, which I'll ask again, cause I think it was pretty interesting. Um, that's was, okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts about the perception of the indie music scene being, um, described as like fairly insular and dominated by, you know, white guys and guitars? Uh, yeah. I mean, I thought about that question, um, since the interview and, and mm -hmm. I think that, um, I still think that, uh, I still think that, that there's a, a, you know, a reason based off of who's interested in playing the music and who's interested in listening to the music. I will say though, that, um, you know, I, I spot just about every person within, uh, the stage view that I can see who's brown. Um, at a Fleet Foxes show, yeah, um, and um, and so they stand out to me, and and um, uh, and so they're you know it's not it's not I mean it is predominantly like you know white people who are coming to Fleet Foxes shows mm. um, in America, yeah, um, and, and in Europe, but um, there's definitely all, all sorts of ages and, and colors of people coming, um, yeah, which is uh, which is you know great I think because yeah. I think. Ideally, as an artist, you know, you wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily make something that's de designed for one specific gender or type of person, you know, but, mm. um, but also one of the things that we were talking about was that by and large, like who is influencing culture, um, right now. And I, and I thought about that 
since the, our last conversation. And, and I really think that, you know, uh, brown people are, are heavily influencing culture in every single way. I mean, mm. if you look at, at least in America, what's happening in our politics, you know, a lot of where there's a lot of bristling right now is with uh, sports, um, people from sports, and predominantly they're brown people, and they're the ones who are, you know, making statements on uh, what they feel is like social justice, uh, what's mm. right and wrong socially. And if you look at music, I mean, it's very broad in music, but I think one of the things, the last things that I could think of that, that people talked about and were so excited about and felt like it was really significant to music and culture was This Is America by Childish Gambino. Um, yeah. You know, that really struck a chord for me and a lot of other people just felt like they saw that. And, and, and his previous record, they were just wowed by what they were hearing and how it all felt. And so, you know, maybe in the guitar playing folk, mm. you know, indie indie scene, it is a lot of like, you know, white guys with beards. But, mm. you know, on the broader broader spectrum, you know, I think that it, it gets um, somewhat more diverse as far as what people I feel like are really, uh, you know, paying attention to. Yeah, yeah. Thinking of, I remember asking about like what your your perspective on how influenced Australian music is from either to anywhere else really. Um, and, um, yeah, and just what, what that was like in your view. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause there's, there's a lot of great, um, uh, Australian bands. And I was talking about my disco mm. who are kind of like a hard band, like hard, heavy band, but they started to do some interesting electronic stuff as well. And, um, to me, uh, yeah, I'm just sort of, yeah, mm. there's some, some great Aussie bands, obviously. So, yeah. In Crack Up, there seems to be a slight um, use of maybe more synthetic sound or or maybe it's just a keyboard or something like that. But is, is that something I'm hearing or am I wrong? Uh, well, Sky definitely added some keyboards and things because um, he's sort of gotten a lot more into the, the synthesized side of, of music mm. as time has gone on. Um, yeah. He still plays guitar and has has a billion pedals and stuff like that, but he sort of become into keyboards as well. So yeah, there's definitely some some keyboard elements in there. Yeah, and sampled sounds as well from from nature and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, there's like there's a train in there. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, and um, yeah, I'm sure there's other other bits in there that that even I don't know about. Okay. I think we've coming up to time, but I've got one more question, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. Um, so Robin was describing the like the process of making Helplessness Blues as kind of like a protracted, maybe a bit of a grind for a number of reasons. And in deciding mm. to um, make Crack Up and, and coming bringing the band back together again, um, he sort of talked about knowing there needed to be a change in the way you approached making uh, the music, maybe like a more process driven rather than results based approach or a more egalitarian approach. Does that re reflect on your experience of making crack up? Um, from, from my view, I mean, it didn't seem too, too much different than the way that I observed helplessness. I mean, there was, pro there was definitely less, uh, everybody in a room um, mm. working on the album um, uh, uh, on crack up but but it seemed it seemed kind of the same to me um, um, but definitely I think you know concerned with process as I think he probably always was but yeah um, but I'm sure he'd be he'd be better to able to answer that question but from my view yeah it was, it was about the same process you know like Robin concentrating on you know, writing and arranging, mm. um, you know, his, uh, material. Okay, cool. And I guess finally, what food recommendations do you have from Seattle that aren't fur and, you know, <laughs> little <laughs> energy bars? Uh, wow. It's tough. Wait, so wh where do you live? Brisbane, Australia. You're in Brisbane. Um, uh, oh, that's interesting because Casey's, uh, wife is from Brisbane. Oh, really? Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, um, well, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember like what I ate in in Brisbane specifically, but mm. I found there to be just like a lot of great food in Australia, and uh, 
and especially Southeast Asian food, yeah. um, which is something that Seattle has a lot of. Mm. Uh, and we're really lucky for that. You know, that's something, you know, that um, that when with the politics of uh, America and the politics of Australia in this effort to keep people from coming um you know, to those countries, mm. um, uh, foreigners to those countries is, yeah. you know, from, from my perspective that, uh, if you just base it off of the food alone, we should want people from other cultures coming to our country and, um, bringing their culture with us. Cause yeah. we benefit, if you just look at the food alone, mm. like we benefit by having those cultures come in and, um, bring, bring in their food and what happens when those things come together you get something yeah. maybe new or maybe maybe better or who knows you know um and and seattle has benefited so much from having the amount of thai people people mm. from vietnam uh certainly japanese and chinese people like we just have a wealth of basically just asian food as a whole here and um and we're better off for it you yeah. know um but as far as seattle goes yeah, I mean, I think honestly, some of our best food is Southeast Asian food yeah. um, uh, or Japanese food, mm. um, which I'm sure you probably have uh, in Australia, given your proximity to Southeast Asia. Yeah, that's so true. I think for Australians, the biggest one of the biggest ways that we connect with other cultures is through food first. Like, oh, wow, pasta, Italian people way back decades ago, and then now pho and ramen and stuff. Yeah. Too true. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think uh, well, and it's interesting that we talk about this now, you know, because uh, I mean, well, I'm sure he, he's probably not in Australia, but this pretty famous uh, writer and chef uh, died, uh, I think, yesterday or early this morning um, in France. Um, mm. This guy Anthony Bourdain. Um, yeah, yeah, um, I heard, yeah, yeah, and, so, and I think that you know one of the things that I think he was trying to get across, and that certainly I think a lot of other people. Um, observed and learned is, is that we really benefit and in, in, uh, from engaging in each other's food mm. and that it really is a portal in, uh, to each other, to each other's culture and to each other personally, you know, mm. um, and uh, on every level. And um, I just, I have a hard time imagining, you know, I mean, it's sort of interesting. It's like, I wonder, you know, <laughs> uh, I wonder like, uh, I wonder, like, what a white supremacist, like, after a white supremacist rally or whatever, or a meeting, what, what they, they go eat, eat. you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like, what if, what if they went and they're like, let's go get some Thai food, or, <laughs> or what if they, what if they thought, let's go, you know, I mean, or, or just whatever it is, or what if they, what if they ate some, some pasta, which, you know, the noodle yeah. is uh, related to Asia, not, you know, um, Europe, didn't originate yeah. from what people what I, what I understand is didn't it not originate in Italy but originating from from Asia mm. um, you know you know obviously you know you can eat whatever you want and believe whatever you want but it's yeah. kind of like we are in each other's culture so the idea of, of uh, rejecting that is just um, backwards yeah it's a great analogy maybe they only eat sauerkraut and sausages strict diet yeah but even, even that i feel like we would trace somehow back to somewhere else yeah. you know and you know like i learned uh and i i mean i could have these things wrong but because I, I i certainly haven't researched them uh deeply but like i learned that the the like scottish bagpipes like they have lineage back to africa maybe that's yeah. wrong but the idea is possible you know it's possible mm. that um that those things are connected in some way. Yeah. And so the idea, you know, I understand the idea of not wanting people to come in because you think it's a drain on resources or you think it's a drain on, uh, or it's a, a threat to stability or something like that. Mm. But, you know, um, I think that, that I, I don't believe those things. And I really yeah. believe, you know, more that there's, there's a, that we benefit by, by having people, um, uh, different people, different cultures around each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and super relevant to Australia right now. Cause we have a really strict and staunch, um, policy against, you know, refugees and like, there's children dying on little, basically Island, uh, camps. It's, I know. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. 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 And mm. I think it's just, uh, you know, I think something that like, 
you know, that you can look at is that, um, Honestly, I don't really think there's any stopping the flow of refugees or the people that want to come. I mean, mm-hmm. you can you can try as much as you want, but some amount of people are, are going to uh, are going to come, and you know, within a generation or maybe two, mm-hmm. it will become norm. Because you got to think back, at least in the states, you know, I mean, we had internment camps where you know we sent you know Japanese people away. Mm-hmm. You know, um, here in Seattle. Uh, there's um, a hot- sort of hotel slash museum to that era where it shows where people were hiding. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, but look, look how generations later at this point um, that that's unthinkable. You know, yeah. Like yeah. We, the way that we spoke about Japanese people or Chinese people um, or Korean people or Vietnamese people as like being these like evil enemy foreigners mm. like maybe still happens somewhere you know but it's pretty much unthinkable on a you know uh on a main level yeah so the way we're speaking about muslims in this country mm. um you know i think you give it a couple generations it you know it will hopefully at least be unthinkable and it takes time um but it certainly is you know disgusting and yeah. um and sort of shameful as it happens you know in current current day I think a huge part of that is people defining other people as, you know, one thing. You're a refugee. You're not, you know, a teacher, a doctor, someone who enjoys, you know, swimming. You know, they really um, uh, minimalize someone down to just one or two things. And usually that thing is like the worst moment of their life, which is the refugee experience, rather than seeing them as a fully fleshed out human with, you know, friendships and desires and you know, kindness. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I think one of the things in, in, in uh, the States that I don't hear so much, I mean, where I live is like, I think a, a, a fairly liberal and, t- and tolerant area of, of Washington mm-hmm. and of the States. And so I'm very much in a bubble that isn't represented other places. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe 10 years ago or something, I, I went to Mexico City with my girlfriend, mm-hmm. um, and it was the first time I ever went anywhere uh, not on tour. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, like I've always traveled on. I mean, I started touring very young, and so anytime I went anywhere, I've always been on tour. So it's first time went to Mexico City. Neither one of us really speak Spanish, and uh, and I not that I ever thought poorly about uh, Mexican people, but it it challenged everything I thought I knew about what I was going to see there. You know, I saw like one, a, a really enormous city, a very metropolitan city, an incredible amount of food. I was vegetarian at the time mm-hmm. and still ate incredible down there. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like some, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just felt like I sort of came to believe that it was going to be this de- destitute city or something like that. But it's yeah. just this metropolis yeah. with a, a train system that ran amazingly well. And, and I came back to the States and I, and I just thought, you know, we don't understand our neighbors, you know, at all. And mm. we have no sympathy for the fact, like, imagine what it must mean for somebody to get on a boat and risk their life, like what they must be coming from to risk yeah. their life to try to come to Australia, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, or try to like cross a desert to come. It doesn't mean that, you know, they should do it or that there's not, that we should have a better way for it. Mm. But they like nobody here in America is going to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so these people are desperate. Yeah. Leaving home is the hardest Um, thing to do. Yeah. 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 So these are, these are people in in the most desperate situation in in, in America, you know, right now we're in this position where we're separating kids from their parents Mm. uh, and doing it because we're saying, well, you know, the parents shouldn't, shouldn't come here with their kids. It's like, but, but they're going to because they either risk what's back at home or they risk coming here and having being separate. And they might think it's better for their children to be separate from them here mm. than stay in Honduras, you know, yeah. which is, which is awful, you know? Yeah. And so we've got to come up with a better way. And I think unless we have, you know, sympathy and empathy for that situation, mm. um, it's not going to get any better. And we're just going to continue to like damage these lives, you know, yeah. but I mean, I could go on and on about it because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's, it's a big topic. You yeah. Know? 
As as someone passionate about politics, is that something you ever want to combine with music, or just as a person of notability in the music scene? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, other other than, I mean, I'm I'm not like a person to write a song with those kind of lyrics or something like that. Mm. Um, but it's been, it's been on my mind of a way to be useful in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know how that would present itself, but, uh, but you know, it's crossed my mind. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, we're definitely over time now, but thanks so much for having this chat with me. Um, You're welcome. Thanks, Morgan. See you, Matt. See you. Have a good day. You too. Okay.